Well, good evening and thank you for joining us. Everyone's talking about uh, the vaccination drive, or at least uh, the people who <laughs> people who are interested in safety are talking about the vaccination drive. Uh, there are several other things that the media is discussing right now, but we're going to focus on the vaccination drive because data from the health ministry tells us that 454,049 people have been inoculated so far. Um, and it also says adverse uh, reactions or adverse events of 0.18%. Uh, simple mathematics, that's a little over 800 people. And 0.02% uh, have been hospitalized. That's nine people altogether so far. Now, here's the interesting thing. The Niti Aayog member, VK Paul, had a press conference today where he said, and I quote, we are not fulfilling our social responsibility if the vaccine assigned to you is not taken, end quote. What was he referring to? Now, he's referring to the fact that there are reports now about healthcare workers among the first batch of people who have been, uh, who've been uh, called in to receive the vaccine. Many of them have apprehensions. They're worried about getting this vaccine. Uh, there are news reports that say there are some AIMS workers who have said that they're not against the vaccine, but they don't want to be guinea pigs, uh, that uh, less than 50% of the staff at Saptajal Hospital have actually signed on to take the vaccine. And the similar reports coming in from across the country uh, for those people who are right now scheduled to receive that vaccine. Interestingly, a lot of the questions being raised right now are about the Bharat Biotech vaccine, co-vaccine, and not the one coming in from the Serum Institute or what we call the Oxford vaccine. Now, why is this? People who receive the Bharat Biotech's co-vaccine are being asked to sign a consent form. The others are not. So obviously this raises questions about the fact that there must be something different, be different between these two. Now, the consent form, according to the WHO, is informed consent, is the principle of getting approval from a recipient before administering any healthcare uh, intervention, especially if this is a under trial uh, you know, either medicine or vaccination, which we know that this co-vaccine is. It's still in its third trial, and we're not expecting the data of how well it is doing or the data of the efficacy from the third trial until March this year. Questions to ask at this point, um, which people are asking, why aren't we just waiting till March for this particular vaccine? What is the need to roll it out right now? Is everybody who's receiving the vaccine fully aware of uh, the fact that they're taking something under trial? People are still not being given a choice between the two. And the question, of course, is that if someone refuses to take the vaccine because they're uncomfortable with it, will their name pop up again? Will they be given another option at a later date? What happens if they refuse? And a question about the fact that a phase three trial is normally done with, it, with a controlled group, which means that half the group will get a placebo the other half will get the actual uh, you know, uh, trial and the numbers will be compared. But in this case, since there's no placebo, how does that affect our understanding of the outcome? To help us understand what is going on, uh, we have a panel of experts joining us. Uh, Dr. Shahid Jamil, uh, virologist, Dr. Rakesh Mishra, director of the Center for Cellular and Micro uh, Molecular Biology, and uh, Murli Nilkantan, who is um, a lawyer who understands uh, you know, pharmaceutical law better than anybody else uh, I have spoken to. Gentlemen, good evening and thank you for joining us. Uh, Woodley, I want to first come to you, if I may, to ask you about this consent form, informed consent. And I know that you've had a chance to look at it. Are there concerns here uh, for people who are signing this consent form, the purely legally and following procedure? Uh, is this something we should worry about? Uh, we should. The new clinical trial rules that were introduced in 2019 list out essential features that are expected to find a place in the form. Now, the vaccine form that we've seen reported in the media contain none of this information. So, for example, it should have information regarding what the therapeutic value of this is, what the alternatives are, and give the person a choice. It should also explain what is the standard of care that they will get. It should explain what is the compensation they will get. It should ask the person the question about his annual income. It should ask them a series of questions about their health. The form as it stands now is like self-certification. 
at best. Uh, I don't have allergies. I don't have any other uh, issues. I've never had uh, fever, that kind of stuff. Now, a lot of these people, as we've seen uh, with the reports for, uh, coming in from the press, uh, don't know if they have an allergy or not. I don't know because I've never tested for allergies. I just assume I don't have allergies. Similarly, there may be people who may have an underlying heart condition, but just don't know about it. Uh, people who may have uh, diabetes, people who may have number of comorbidities, which don't affect them in their day-to-day -day lives, don't know about it, and just manage to live with it. So it's not enough to say we've signed a form. What is essential is that you have all the elements that the law requires in the form. And secondly, screen these people so that you can verify what's been put on the form. So to say that I've never had a fever in the last 14 days, I may not have noticed, but I may have had a fever. To say that I have not had COVID ever, I may have had a mild case of COVID that was never actually uh, diagnosed. So there's a lot of issues with informed consent. We've also seen issues with people who could not have understood any of this. So if you read the form, even if you do understand English, a lot of it is not going to be easily understandable to you. And if you write that in Kannada or Tamil or any other language or Hindi, even a Hindi speaker will find it very difficult to understand what it means. So that's your first problem. How does it normally address in a clinical trial? Normally what happens is that the doctor will sit down the patient and talk them through this. Now in this case, it's being administered in booths. So there's no doctor actually sitting and having this counseling session with the patient saying, uh, here is your medical history. Here's why we think it's good for you or here is why you shouldn't get it. That counseling is not happening. And you can't do it when you have lacks of these people. And finally, most importantly, it is the doctor, the principal investigator, as he's called, who's responsible to make sure that this is done. And every doctor is signing up in the rules to say, I am following these rules. So for me, that there are violations is India. We're going to have it. What troubles me is that doctors are not doing their jobs. They're not treating these people as their own patients and doing what's right for them. They're doing it to just fill the numbers and say, let's get phone calls, let's call people, send them SMSs, get them to fill the booths and uh, inject them with the vaccine. So there's a lot of issues with informed consent as the law requires it. But, uh, Dr. Shamil, if I may ask you a question, and the reason why I think a lot of people are also worried is because Bharat Biotech put out a notice uh, just yesterday advising certain people to avoid Covaxin if they have allergies, fever, bleeding disorders, are taking at this point blood thinners, are immune compromised in any way, are pregnant or lactating. Um, automatically, obviously, people sat up and said, oh, is there something wrong with this thing that all of these people shouldn't be taking it? Um, do everyone who is taking it right now understand these things? Is it likely they might have one of these disorders and not know about it? Would you explain to us what this means? What, what, would you, what did you understand from uh, the notice that Bharat Biotech put out? Well, from, from what I understand from this is that they're trying to legally cover themselves for every possible thing that could or may go wrong. Uh, Murli probably would be able to explain it much better than, than I can. Mm -hmm. uh, but from uh, a scientific point of view, uh, I think what has been seen with other COVID vaccines and especially with the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, is that people with underlying allergies have uh, not had a very good run of this. Whether it's the you know, the cases in Norway and Sweden or uh, yes. otherwise. Uh, but, you know, there is, there is something called random association and the other would be causality. Mm. Uh, and I'll give you an example of this. <clears throat> you know, uh, Bell's palsy or facial paralysis at random happens to 110 people every day in United States. Now, if one of those happens to take a vaccine and mm. next day has facial paralysis, mm. is it due to the vaccine or is it just a random event? Uh, uh, we know that heart attacks usually happen in morning hours. 
Mm. Also eat breakfast in the morning. Can you correlate breakfast with heart attacks? Of course not. But if somebody takes a vaccine a day before having a heart attack in the morning, that's immediately related to a vaccine. So it's very hard to prove random events versus causality. And therefore, it is very, very important for every event like this to be thoroughly investigated. That's very important, especially when it happens in a, in a clinical trial. Yeah. But from, to answer mm. your question, I think they're simply covering uh, themselves for any, any legal uh, processes. Murli, go ahead. You wanted to come in? Uh, actually, you know, the causality bit is not what the law says. Mm. Uh, I've seen the notes, I've seen press releases on it which say caused by. That is not the term used. Uh, I've had a long series of discussions with the author of those rules, uh, Professor Roy Chaudhary, before they came out in 2013. And it was my disagreement with him. And we finally concluded that the language there will be related to, which is not the same as caused by. So... Victims are entitled to compensation if the injury is related to the trial. It doesn't have to be caused by the vaccine. I know this, is, this feels like splitting hairs and it's a legalese, but it is very, very important. If the law wanted to say caused by, it would have said caused by. Lawyers understand the difference between caused by and related to. Caused by, as doctor said, requires this clear causal element. But the reality is that it's very difficult in science to prove this causality element in a clinical trial because we just don't have enough data. If you waited 10 years, you would be able to say, yes, we have enough evidence to say that there is a likely cause. Even then, it's a likely cause. It is not definite. So that is the reason why the rules very specifically say injury related to a clinical trial. And that injury in this case could be caused by a failure of screening, failure of informed consent, uh, failure of uh, standard of care to help them deal with an adverse effect. Uh, it could be failure of protocol. So all of any of these or all of these could cause the injury. It doesn't have to be in the words it's that you used, caused, specifically yeah. caused by some defect in the vaccine. That is not how the rules read. So compensation is really available for a wider range of people in a trial. Do you think we're in dangerous territory here, given what uh, Bharat Biotech has put out? Because there would be women who are pregnant who wouldn't know of it. There would be people who have maybe a bleeding disorder or an immunity disorder not know of it. To, to sort of just say, hey, listen, and to then later say, we, we told you. Is, is that the whole point of this, this notice, as Dr. Jamil was saying? Actually not. So I'm Concerned that the notice is not more elaborate and clearer because that would protect uh, the company. Mm. Not having clear notice actually hurts you. Uh, if you say things like caused by the vaccine, when the law actually is related to the vaccine, uh, you don't actually set out that they can get compensation if the protocol is violated, if informed consent is not given properly you're actually getting yourself into more and more trouble because all the defenses you could have taken to say, I told you so, now you can't take any more. So the, I find that to be a, a, a silly way of dealing with it. It's high risk and quite unnecessary. So your legal advice is to get a better lawyer for Bharat Bhatt. <laughs> I think this is not a legal issue, Faye. Uh, this is way past the law. It is into high politics. Uh, I'm sure they've not worried too much about the law. Uh, the history of clinical trials in India and, as you know, product liability for drugs uh, mm. hasn't really bothered pharmaceutical companies. So I think they think of it as ticking the box. Yes, there is a form. They've signed it. Uh, nobody's going to claim compensation. And the government, with the IC, uh, ICMR being a sponsor, is going to say, oh, no, 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 no. It's not caused by the vaccine. So I think there is a nudge and a wink on this to say, mm. don't worry about it. I, so Dr. Mishra. I think I'll give a little more considerate due to Bharat Biotech. I think all what they're trying to do is to avoid bad publicity because even by coincidence, <laughs> something accidents happen, somebody uh, fails, tips on the other side. You see the Norway 
probably most of those guys uh, were in very bad condition and like things just stick to the one way. So I think both the company, I understand even Serum Institute has issued such a thing. So it is just to avoid the bad publicity because in the early days, they, all the, this vaccine future depends on first few weeks, I would say. If two, three weeks pass by nice, most people do well, they are in the business, then later everything is started out. In the beginning, just few things. It's like uh, a match. Good opening means uh, you can have now a solid opening. They can happen in cricket, but today we can talk, we'll talk about cricket. <laughs> so I, I, have, I have the feeling we would have a few cricket analogies on today's show. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it is just to make sure that they don't get the bad, bad publicity and uh, so avoid this thing. As far as pregnant women, this is not supposed to be given to pregnant women and uh, below 18 years anyway, right? This is already uh, there. So they're just trying to be extra, uh, uh, take extra precaution. That's all I would give. I'll not put more on that. So, uh, Dr. Mishra, let me ask you this question then. Given the uh, the things that Bharat Biotech has written in its notice, um, and we'll come to a couple of other things: allergies, fever, bleeding disorder, blood thinner, immune compromise, pregnant, lactating women. Do you think perhaps there's a little more about the risk than they're letting on? Because on one hand, we have a government that has cleared this for administration, and on the other hand, the company is saying, "Hey, there are all of these things that could be risks." Do people know? on the ground is this should it have been cleared if, if the company manufacturing it has these concerns no i think uh, i i don't think that way because unless uh, the company were hiding some information and now they want to uh, uh, to uh, bring them in some way or other i don't think in 3 days uh, whatever we have seen there is any such indication that more precaution or extra precaution is taken I think they are simply responding to what has happened in the West. The, some uh, of these vaccines, uh, uh, now uh, some death in senior people. So, uh, so they are just trying to be extra precaution. I, I, I'm, uh, I don't want to uh, believe that uh, they are now uh, um, taking this precaution because recently something happened or they were hiding. I mean, one thing I uh, would like to believe that these vaccines are safe. How good they are for uh, us, for how long they will protect us uh, is uh, anybody's guess. But I think they are safe. Otherwise, it will be so simple for any company to launch something which is going to kill you forever. Uh, so I And also, I think uh, regulatory agency will take that much care that uh, it is safe. And the thing something is given for phase 3 that means it is uh, by all our uh, criteria is safe. So, and all now we are talking about is the safety. So, I'm not sure. I think it is just to make make sure that uh, no bad publicity uh, comes in. Well, uh, I want to, if I may, share a uh, RTI uh, that, uh, you know, that, that a young journalist actually filed and, uh, you know, my, my colleague will put that up on the screen for you to take a look at. Uh, now, this is the, uh, the health ministry's DCGI, and if we just click on the document there, basically uh, the question that was asked is, is there any immunity being provided to these companies, uh, you know, uh, in terms of their legal risk? The response given by the regulator has been no info. However, individuals have to assess the risk and benefits before using the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, the language here is very interesting. It almost seems as if um, the liability is being entirely palmed off to the person taking the vaccine. And then that brings us to the question of, are the, is there enough information being given to the people taking the vaccine in the booths in which it is happening, at the rate at which it's happening? Four and a half lakh people vaccinated in our country already. Um, if this is what the regulator feels, that people who are using the vaccine must understand the risks and benefits and assess the risks and benefits before they take it. Do you believe that these, you know, the, the pace at which we're, we're inoculating and the response of the regulator uh, can actually be reconciled, Dr. Mishra? I don't think this is possible. You just heard Murli uh, explaining it. And uh, the, the, if you are, I mean, even in one center, 100 people are uh, taking vaccine. What you are talking about is a couple of hours of somebody to understand, explain, and see. That's just simply not possible. I mean, we are got used to this. Every software installed, uh, 
two page of uh, yeah, I agree to this. So it's something like that. This is what we call is fine print. Nobody reads fine print. It all goes by publicity, hearsay, uh, so and so has taken, they are doing fine. You can see on the TV, people come and showing their arms, I've taken no pain and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. vaccine is safe, I took it, I'll give to my grandchildren. Those are not the arguments. I mean, there is, it is very, it's true that there is less data, there is uh, uh, things have been done in a hurry, but uh, we are talking about something unusual, uh, extraordinary condition. And uh, my uh, view is that it's many even well-educated people will not understand those details. And how many people know what is allergy? I mean, none of us have got tested for allergy. How do you know whether you're allergic or not something? Is, you can say yes or you can say no, both are incorrect actually. So far you have not noticed something like that. <laughs> we are learning some leakers in there. So, yeah. are so you, know, you know, I, I remember as a child, uh, as a young person, my dad taught me to answer questions that the doctor would ask with the answer, not that I know of, <laughs> not that I'm aware of. So yeah. I might be allergic to something, but I don't know of it yet, which is actually the right way to answer this question. How many people know what they are allergic to? You might be allergic to something that you have not been exposed to yet. And that might pop up, you're saying, as a reaction most difficult thing to diagnose the allergy is not so that easy there is a, you have to test i don't know what all people test if you see the how allergy test is very really weird actually so it's very difficult we are talking very different thing and i think it, all it boils down to a uh, few things a uh, could we wait can we wait there will be both ways virus is weak if we hit it at this time maybe we can just get over the other side if mm. it, roi uh, if you are doing something which is a minimum uh, gain, how much money, how much effort is put, so this I will give to agencies to, who are involved to figure out whether they are investing in the right way or not. So those are the issues that there are the no real uh, uh, ways of, of uh, really scientifically quantifying them and comparing. Uh, everybody knows that these are emergency approvals. Everybody knows that this is not a vaccine that can be sold as a recognized thing and will protect you for so long and so on. So I think uh, it's a strategic decision, it's policy decision that let's do it this time and let's get uh, other side and get whatever mileage we can get. Because to me, I think we can't we can't afford another uh, lockdown. So that okay. is the case then. I mean, that's what I interpreted. Otherwise, why would one take... Uh... So, so, but then, you know, that, that brings me to my next question. We know quite publicly the Serum Institute of India has said that it manufactured 50 million doses. Obviously, we are not using currently all 50 million doses. They have it there. India is now considering shipping doses to other countries. Be that as it may, we do, it's unlikely that we will exhaust that entire, uh, you know, reservoir of vaccines before March which is when the co-vaccine data is expected. Let's assume it comes in on time. Would it have hurt that much for the regulator to just wait until March until the data was in hand so that all of these questions, all the questions raised by the panel this evening would have just been answered with that data? Is, was, it, was the rush warranted? Dr. Jamil, would you have recommended in your expert opinion that we wait until March until we see that data? Yes, absolutely. And because of the ground conditions that you just described, Serum Institute is on record to say that I have 50 million doses in my refrigerator and uh, I am going to use it for the country. Now, the country had declared that by March, the country will give vaccine to uh, 30 million people. 10 million healthcare workers and uh, 20 million uh, uh, frontline guess, workers. Yes. That makes it uh, 60 million doses. If Serum Institute had 50 in the fridge and they were perfectly capable of making 10 million doses a month, then uh, till March, we could have easily covered with Covishield. Let Covaxin uh, data come out, efficacy data come out. And, uh, you know, then roll it out. And I'm uh, to your previous question that you asked Rakesh, I'm actually quite appalled that DCGI will say that people will assess the risk and benefit themselves. And, and you know, isn't that the reason why we have a regulator who, uh, who decides that 
the product that is being approved has a very high benefit to risk ratio we understand that everything has a risk but when the benefit overwhelmingly uh, are over the risk then there is an approval right uh, how can the, how can the regulator approve something and then tell the public that you are on your own to assess the risk and benefit i'm quite appalled by that reply in fact i must acknowledge your my internet was down so i wasn't able to open that document but it's sorov das the journalist slash rti yep. activist who has accessed this information sent in the rti to the uh, dcgi and got this response sorov does amazing work we are always grateful to him uh, for the work that he's done and you can check it out uh, for our audience this is available on sorov das's twitter handle uh, a good twitter handle to follow as well uh, if you are interested in the information Uh, specifically in the RTI information that he's uh, digging up, sort of does on Twitter that you can see on your screen right now. Great job that he's uh, he's doing. Goodly, my next question is to you. So that brings us to the next point. Now, as um, you know, as an informed-ish citizen, because we can only be informed to the extent that we have data, uh, you know, uh, to uh, uh, that we can access. As an informed citizen, if I decide not to take Covaxin. That's the thing that has been made available. So, assuming a healthcare worker walks up to the booth and says, "Oh, it's Covaxin. I don't want it. Thank you very much." We have the Niti Aayog member of VK Paul who has said, "We are not fulfilling our social responsibility if the vaccine assigned to you is not taken." So, this is an interestingly structured, uh, you know, uh, sentence. We, as a collective, are not fulfilling our social responsibility if the vaccine assigned to you. is not taken um does this sentence have any clues here as to how the government is reading the citizens responsibility to take the vaccine assigned to them what does this mean uh it's a niti aayog usually has good phraseology so you should expect something like that to come through uh it's a nice one for a politician to say uh, to try and get people to do their duty uh and therefore you know it's a welcome move by politicians to say that unfortunately it lacks credibility if the social responsibility and duty was to isolate social distancing not have political rallies not have kumbh mela i would have had a little bit of sympathy with that statement but when you put out this statement there is a kumbh mela going on and there are lakhs of people congregating uh you have political rallies going on there are lakhs of people congregating so to say that the vaccine is now social duty when social distancing was not hygiene was not none of those isolation was not just seems like nice pr uh it's a nice thing to say uh, a few more ministers will say it i don't know if it will find a place in the man ki baat but you know it's a nice one to say it doesn't have any at the moment legal basis Uh, mm. you can't say the law required you to take a vaccine uh there have been as you've probably seen uh, some threats issued to uh, healthcare workers uh who threatened with being sacked if they don't take the vaccine uh in a hospital so we've seen that already so we've had different i think this is the posh version of what that letter said is do your duty uh thankfully it's not the law yet so people but, can but refuse nothing nothing is stopping the government body from moving an ordinance to of course fight. of course of course uh you know if, if you can have love jihad law you can have uh vaccination law uh, we've seen in the emergency uh sterilization camps uh and you know this is called a vaccination booth so you know mm-hmm. if you really wanted to be terrible about it uh you can you know threaten people into vaccination and as we've discussed before uh once you get from this stage to saying we won't mm. let you into an office we won't let you yeah. into a school we won't let you out of your own house until you have a vaccination certificate then you're getting from social duty you're enforcing this social duty in ways that are infringing on liberty so mm. i think we're seeing the signs uh, so there is there is a possibility together. in the very least of a vaccine passport that will give you access to public spaces airports offices train stations that sort of thing and the lack of a vaccine have you if you have refused 
may prevent you from doing your job uh, it's already happened so uh, it's not too far in the future we've discussed it as a possibility a couple of months ago in december uh, now when you get your vaccination you get your second shot there will be a qr code mm. and the app will read the qr code and update it so uh, you will have everybody who's vaccinated downloads the app updates their status with the qr code and that effectively becomes your as they call right. immunity passport I, and, so and, and that's this happening is, this, this is a new app this is not the arogya setu app this is no. the covin Win app, app. Yeah. c o for covid w i n for victory has to be read as covin and not cow in so it's the careful of how you read that but it's a covin app and it's meant to actually track the people who have been given their first dose yes. who will be followed up for the second dose will also qualify you to move around without uh, you know without worrying about passing on that uh, you know th- that virus but i i saw dr mishra laugh a little bit when you brought up the emergency he might not agree with that analogy dr mishra do you think that's an exaggeration <laughs> i i uh, i remember the emergency times <laughs> <laughs> i know i mean my village what used to be this nation i think we are in different time we have people are more uh, uh, i would say empowered because of the internet and mobile and other things there is i don't think we can be taken for a ride that way is very different and uh, i i i will be uh, i mean we can't say but i don't think there can be a vaccine passport because if that is there that will be a stupid thing to do because we know that vaccine will work maybe 60% 70% people rest will not work so you are giving somebody to license to kill who doesn't know how to handle but, it but uh, doc 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 arogya setu was it's turned happened. into a passport and it didn't work at all and we weren't allowed inside the airport without downloading that app so technically the two happened. things don't yeah. necessarily yeah. logically have to you know so it's not no. yes doc mishra yes yeah. so i i was just saying that if this kind of thing is done it will be a silly thing to do because you are giving somebody that you are now safe although without knowing that 30% of them may not be safe uh, my guess is these vaccines will be at the best 70% at the best uh, efficacy and we do not know this passport is valid for 3 months or 6 months or 8 months after that everybody is uh, uh, vulnerable so i don't think these are the thing that i would like to see that it in a way what uh, the system is trying to do government is trying to do is to uh, uh, minimize uh, the spread and somehow uh, get out of this because you remember actually i just wanted to add i mean uh, although i fully agree with what shahid said that you have a dose of vaccine so why you bring in another one so there are two things they are trying to do one is to uh, show that you are a big brother a powerful nation around so give to your neighbors something and help them out and so on that one gives you lots of brownie points and so you need maybe more dose and those kinds of things in this process and other thing is uh, if we decide to do vaccine if we see that these are safe then i think it should be done as much as possible and as to many as many as possible because if we are allowing virus to grow in certain population if we are giving the virus a chance to mutate and uh, then it might the whole thing might be uh, of no use if a variant comes which is now Uh, uh just be uh, becoming uh, uh more infectious so if it was ideal if we could get a vaccine which could prevent even 60 70% of the people and we can give to as many as possible maybe we will do uh, uh something uh, uh very very uh, in, uh, useful to to control this but the point is none of us these are sure we do not know where we are so i think we are taking chances we can afford it so we do it hopefully it will not do any uh, right. and how much benefit it will give us will be uh, uh, only time will tell i think i would like chaid to, uh, uh, to to add to this he may have different perspective on this and more informed one maybe dr jamin go ahead well uh, i mean firstly on these uh, immunity passports i as murli was talking i i had a thought uh, uh would parliament be open only after mps get vaccinated <laughs> would assemblies would assemblies open only after mlas and mlcs get uh, vaccinated 
uh, well, schools have opened, but parliament hasn't. And uh, MP who are not having comorbidity, they will not get the yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> also, elections, uh, Doc, no, there's, yeah, there's election. a big ticket election yeah. coming up uh, in yeah. the next few months. Yeah. So actually, every everyone who uh, who is a candidate in the election should be required to take a vaccine and fulfill their social responsibility. You know, well they could be they could be spreading the virus to uh, in all the election meetings that happen. If that's the logic. Mm. Well, they oh. will be, the, the virus, they could be spreading the virus. We know they will be spreading a lot worse um, at, at <laughs> these election meetings <laughs> to have it. But I, I want to just talk about, you know, we talked about the fact that it would have been perhaps better advised for the regulator to wait until March because, uh, you know, uh, people would have been more comfortable. There would have been less fear or less apprehension about vaccines in general. Yeah. More people would have come forward because everyone would be confident. There is a lack of confidence and perhaps a trust deficit at this point. Now, let's assume again, there is a healthcare worker, Dr. Jimmy, this question is for you, who walks up to the, uh, to the box and says, oh, this is co-vaccine. Actually, you know what? I don't want to take it. I'm going to opt out. Will that person be given another chance um, in the second round or the third round? Will that person be given another chance with a different vaccine, uh, you know, uh, further down the line? Or has that person, or is it that, you know, you answered yes or no, now you've taken the door on your right and you're outside the building. Now you're done. You're never going to come back into life. Um, especially if what Murli says is going to turn out to be true, which is that you get locked out of many things, not just the vaccine booth. Do you believe that people should be given more options? Well, uh, if the intent is to uh, vaccinate healthcare workers so that they are protected because they are in the highest risk job and if they get an infection, even if it's asymptomatic, they may be transmitting it to people in hospitals mm -hmm. who are sick and who you know, may get more severe disease then I believe if the intent is to protect both the healthcare workers as well as their patients, then they should be given another chance. You can't say that, okay, you've missed your chance. Okay, thank you very much, so be it. It can't be that. It all depends on what the intent is. And I believe the intent is right to, uh, to protect both the healthcare worker as well as their patients. And therefore, they must be given another the chance. Uh, but I'm not clear uh, uh, as to what uh, the government or the ministry is planning right now. So, so you're not clear about what they're planning, but you did say if the intent is four times in that answer, yeah. could there be any doubt of what the intent is? No, no, is? of course not. I'm, 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 I am not doubting. I, I'm not <laughs> doubting it at all. I, I do believe that's the intent, and that's why... Mm -hmm. You know, it was said that one crore healthcare workers are going to be vaccinated uh, in the very first round on priority. So the intent is very clear. There's yes. no problem with that. In fact, you know, as a layperson, I would assume that the doctors and the nurses understand this documentation, understand this far better than the rest of us do. Woodley shaking his head. Uh, but, uh, you know, that. And then if, if they are apprehensive, if half the doctors are apprehensive or half the healthcare workers are apprehensive, I'm going to also perhaps get a little worried. Um, Woody, I will ask you why you're smiling. Do you believe that the healthcare workers don't understand the process of, of clinical trials? Uh, so most of them will not. Let's be clear. Not every healthcare worker has participated in a clinical trial. Uh, it's restricted to certain hospitals, to certain investigators, doctors who run clinical trials. So they don't automatically understand how clinical trials work. Secondly, we've seen official letters written by residents and doctors of hospitals to their deans saying, please don't force us to be vaccinated with this because we don't have data. And we can't make up our minds without data. So what you saw in the RTI, you figure it out for yourselves. Their response to that is we can't figure it out because we have no data. So please don't force us into being vaccinated. We're also seeing people make up excuses because they're scared of their bosses for not being vaccinated. 
we've seen this already and this is not something i'm making up there are people who are reporting on this saying 50% of them didn't turn up saying sorry i haven't had my breakfast this morning oh i had a little bit of fever yesterday ways to avoid getting the vaccine so we're seeing that already uh, it's it's and that was why i was thinking when you said you know uh, are, do they know what they are getting into uh, they're avoiding it because they don't know what they are getting into so uh, that's my take on it so uh, the other question that i did have is that under normal circumstances if we weren't in a pandemic if our economy had not come to a grinding halt if uh, you know the whole world weren't waiting for this vaccine to be available a phase 3 trial would be conducted with a controlled group of people where half would receive the actual dose and the other half would receive a placebo and then the numbers of the two batches would be uh, would be compared in this case where there is no placebo where everybody is getting what is called an open label which is something that's under trial that you you're giving to the general public does that change the quality of the data or the interpretation of the data in any way dr mishra a very interesting uh, question so it's not a trial anymore and even in these situations uh, why one should go for a trial when there is a vaccine available and there is emergency there is a problem how you try new vaccine better vaccines it is something very very you need really very uh, i don't know dedicated people are very sincere people who will go now for uh, trial and take placebo and risk infection so that a better vaccine is available to the rest of the, uh, the people is very uh, i don't know ethically and morally uh, not very simple thing now to to figure out otherwise i am not expert of trials but i would think this is a good way in the sense that if you give to 100 people and 70 of them get protected so one way you can interpret now uh, that maybe there is something of that kind is the efficacy is not a standard way but now as this virus has started many things you know, new normal so new ways of uh, approving vaccine we have already seen so new way of trials will emerge so <laughs> as long as it is safe it doesn't uh, do much damage you no know, that's that's super interesting because we're doing a trial to find out efficacy and safety but we're short circuiting the trial and we're saying as long as it's safe it's okay to short circuit the trial so that doesn't actually make sense uh, as to as to how that will work uh, would you do you want to also answer that question of how that will change to, yes sorry go ahead back to that it's like uh, uh, we allow uh, uh, plasma therapy or we allow certain drugs to terminally uh, uh, ill patients the drugs which are not proven as there are some such condition when you invoke emergency of a certain kind then many of these things seem to be justifiable but uh, you go out uh, in my village people think there is nothing called covid and uh, that uh, we are just being misguided and this vaccine is for some other purpose is not for covid i don't want to discuss that so it's very different uh, depending upon how you look at these things that's all so what you cover so i yes. uh, say two things uh, one is that the trial the clinical trial is still on mm. so there is a hopefully okay. scientific study of efficacy in phase 3 for the vaccine now data oh, that for for uh, for the vaccine so there is a trial ongoing that data will come out for march mm. this that we are doing which is the government sponsored immunization program for want of a better phrase is not a clinical trial under the ctri so there are no controls we're not doing screening we're just napalming the population and hoping it will all fix the problem so it's it's not a clinical trial so to even call this a short circuited clinical trial gives clinical trials a bad name so it's not a trial uh which is giving it away free we think it is safe and we're hoping it will do no damage so that's mm-hmm. the philosophy here now to answer dr mishra's question on we're trying things there is a provision in the law for what we call off label use which is that there is a drug or a medicine it has not been known to be used as prescribed on the label so it might be for indication x the doctor thinks hey you know i think it will work in this emergency i can use it but that is specific to each doctor and each patient that's an off label use that is recognized by the regulation this is not 
there is no justification for this kind of a use, uh, mm. especially to healthy people. There's absolutely no justification to give this to healthy people because there is no risk reward analysis for a healthy person. What is the healthy person going to think? What is the alternative to this? If I get ill, I will get uh, into hospital. I will get treatment. And 98% of the time, I'll get well. That is the risk reward analysis that a common man is going to want to do. And the doctor should be telling that person to say, here is a trial. You are getting a vaccine. We think it is safe. If you don't take the vaccine, there is a 2% chance you will get it. And a small percentage that you might die. And these percent don't make any sense because for the person who dies, it is a 100% chance of death, right? It doesn't matter that 99 others haven't died. To the person who dies and his family, the fact that you are the 1% actually is no consolation or comfort. So it's a very poor way of understanding these percentages. Only 1,000 people have died. Only 500 have died. To those 500, it doesn't matter that 1 lakh have survived. It is absolutely no consolation. So in cases like this, this where you have healthy volunteers dying, this 0.004% uh, say that to the people whose families uh, where people have died. I think it's just, I find it uncouth. I mean, just how can people say such things? Dr. Jamil, um, you know, and this brings up the, the case that took place in Norway where 29 people passed away after died after taking the vaccine. We understand that they were elderly, uh, but is that uh, uh, combined with the fact that we have concerns about the manner in which our vaccines are being approved? Is there any reason at all in your mind for us to worry? Well, I really feel that both vaccines, Covishield as well as Covaxin, have crossed the bar for safety. Uh, they have been proven to be safe in phase one, in phase two, and also in phase three. I mean, phase three is not complete for Covaxin, but whatever, uh, you know, out of 25,600 that were originally going to be recruited for Covaxin, 23,000 have been recruited and have been given at least one injection. So let's say half of those got placebo and half got the vaccine. So at least in 11,500 people, uh, the vaccine has been proven to be safe, even in phase three. What is missing is the efficacy data as to how effective this vaccine is. Okay. So let's not think that these vaccines are unsafe. Yes, adverse events happen in vaccines. Adverse events happen in all vaccines. Adverse events also happen in vaccines that are licensed. Uh, and, and, you know, they could be related events, as, as Murli said earlier, related to instead of caused by. Uh, so, you know, we have to be logical and keep this in consideration. Uh, let's not shoot down uh, the vaccine for what has already been proven for it. Safety has been proven. Efficacy has not been proven. That's the bottom line. So safety has been proven, uh, which means that these are safe, although that idea of safety being perhaps made um, difficult to accept by the company itself by putting out a notice saying, hey, if you have all of these yeah. various or one of these various... Yeah, of course, safety has not been proven long term and safety yeah. has not been proven for any vaccine long term because right. we are in a pandemic. We are trying to end a pandemic with a vaccine. So you can't wait for six months or a year to prove long term safety. So these are the issues that we need to understand. These are the issues that need to be explained. Mm -hmm. And as Morley was saying earlier, these are exactly the issues that should be explained to people who are getting the vaccine as an emergency use vaccine. Yes. And, you know, so I have, I mean, I, I know that this has come up in the past, but when we say that, hey, you know what, we have two vaccines. On one hand, in my right hand is the one that Serum Institute is manufacturing, 50 million doses. It's completed trials in the UK, in Brazil, and in India. You know, this is the documentation. This is the efficacy. This is the whatever, whatever, whatever we have. Let's clear it for use. 
On the other hand, I am clearing this other vaccine that has not completed its final trial. I don't have the data in hand, but I'm clearing it in emergency use under caution. Now, what constitutes an emergency in this particular situation? And why is it that the healthcare workers walking up to the booth find themselves in that emergency? Just as easily out of, uh, I mean, it's almost as random because why am I in an emergency and the other guy who's getting the, the COVID shield is not in an emergency? How is that fair? Yeah. So honestly, I have not really seen any scientific logic for the approval of Covaxin. Uh, all sorts of smoke screens have been there that it will cover the mutant better. No evidence for it. It's a backup vaccine. Uh, it's not a backup vaccine. It's been given to people. The person who said it's a backup vaccine got that vaccine. Uh, it's not a backup vaccine. It's rolled out. On par. Yes. Or at par. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think the way it has been done was really unnecessary. Uh, and it just raised too many questions, too many concerns. Uh, shouldn't have been there. We should be happy that we have a whole bouquet of vaccines coming up in India. We should be really proud of that, proud of our vaccine companies. Yet we are, all we are discussing is these controversies. Mm. Totally unnecessary, not needed. So it doesn't necessarily raise questions on the science of it, but the manner in which regulation is functioning, the manner in which communication is functioning, the manner in which government is functioning, actually, there are a lot of questions on that. Um, Bulli, you look like you want to say something. Go ahead. Uh, it, it, it brings up the issue of fairness, isn't it? Uh, yeah. If I'm a healthcare worker, the government's giving me something. It is discriminating. And to me, that's a fundamental issue that you're discriminating between two sets of people, those who get vaccine A and those who get vaccine B. Uh, they don't have a choice. You're giving them and forcing them to take it. And the consequences of not taking it are a restriction on liberty. So it's, it's a scary way for libertarians like me to be looking at this and saying, uh, I'm forced to do something which is clearly a product that is not approved under law. And if I don't comply, then there are restrictions on my liberty. To me, that's a strong issue, especially when you have enough doses of an approved mm -hmm. vaccine. You're now going down this path. Uh, it looks exceptionally discriminatory to me. So I, I am very concerned. Uh, it's a human rights issue. It's a constitutional rights issue. Dr. Mishra? I, I agree, uh, although I will not go to that extent, but I think if uh, I'm a healthcare worker, or for whatever reason, uh, I refuse to take a vaccine, I should not be discriminated. It's my personal opinion. And we are free country. We cannot force someone uh, uh, for something. And um, I don't know how much coercing will happen, how much uh, within the department and those pressure, but that is all uh, part of our society. But I think uh, as a system, uh, those to take the vaccine, they cannot be forced. And if they come next time, they should be given equal chance to uh, do their lottery again and keep trying their luck until then uh, take the risk. Uh, uh, so these, all these things should be accommodated. I would say because healthcare workers are so precious, so crucial in this thing, they all should be given one vaccine, which uh, we decide is the, let's say for to be more safe, uh, politically more correct, more available vaccine or for which more data is available. Otherwise, others, other one may be as good or whatever. That would have been simplified the thing. But, uh, but uh, whatever is the thing, but I think if I don't take vaccine for whatever reason, there's no reason for anybody to, to discriminate because we are not discriminating or uh, shooting somebody if they're not wearing mask. Uh, so why vaccine thing? And uh, you can go from top to bottom and you can see hundreds of examples. They don't even have manners how to wear a mask or, or uh, so. So these are not the issues. These so, are so just 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 to then put it in a nutshell, I think what, what we've established here is, and, and the doctors have said over and over again, that the safety uh, is not in question here because the two trials that have been uh, completed 
actually assert the safety that this is a safe vaccine. The thing that is still being tested is the efficacy of how effective it is and for how long. But the fundamental point that is unfair here is that there are two vaccines available at varied degrees of readiness. On one hand, there is a vaccine that's completed all three trials in three different countries, has data available. But on the other hand, there's a vaccine that has not completed that entire process. To clear them and distribute them on par as if they are equal and not give people on you know receiving this vaccine on the other end a choice. Do I want to take that risk? where the company themselves and the documentation displays the fact that you are taking a larger risk because you're signing a form, you're, you know, you're answering questions. To not be given that choice of whether or not you actually want to take that risk is fundamentally unfair because the two, two vaccines are different at this point. If they were completely the same in terms of the fact that they had completed the same uh, perhaps rigor in their trial and they had finished both at the same level and received the same clearance from the government, then perhaps it would be okay to say, listen, we're not giving you a choice and it is your social responsibility to take whatever you're getting. But the government itself has said that the Bharat Biotech co-vaccine has been released in emergency as a backup. So in that case, why is there a certain set of people who are receiving this emergency backup? What have they done to fall into that emergency backup category that the government should answer? Uh, or those who are at least designing this vaccination uh, drive should answer that question uh, if, if they want people to go up to the booths without any concern. But we're going to try and continue to answer questions. I want to apologize to my audience. My Wi-Fi is down, so I'm connected right now using 4G and my phone. So I haven't been able to read your chats or read your questions, but we will continue to have conversations like this where we answer as many questions as we can. And I hope that the questions that were asked and answered in this conversation uh, helped clear some of the doubts that you have this evening. To our panel, gentlemen, thank you so much for always being so generous with your time and answering our questions. It's a pleasure to have a conversation with you. Uh, may we all remain safe until such time as the vaccination is available, uh, which is, uh, which let's just say stays within our fundamental rights and the, you know, the guardrails drawn by our constitution. Thank you all for watching. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.